Hi, and welcome to the video uh, for section 4.7. This is the second video of two videos. In the first video, I introduced you guys to the antiderivative. In this video, we're going to look at a few examples, see how the whole process works. So first example, let's say we want to find all functions g And the key here is all, and we'll see what that means later, but all functions g such that g prime of x is equal to 4 sine of x plus 2x to the fifth minus the square root of x all over x. So, we have the derivative g prime, we want to find the antiderivative, what was the main function that if I took the derivative of the main function would give me this guy. So first and foremost, if you remember the table that we built at the end of last video, I, I just want all the pieces separate and then I can take the antiderivative of each piece. So the first thing I want to do is separate this uh, quotient right here, this fraction. So we get what? We get 4 sine of x, and so then I'm just going to essentially change this fraction into two fractions. So plus 2x to the fifth over x minus square root of x over x. And this square root of x is what? This is like x to the one half. Because again, we're going to be wanting to working with the exponents, so get rid of radicals if we can. Let's simplify this one more time before we get into the antiderivative. So 4 sine of x. One of the x's in the denominator here cancels with one of these, so I'm just left with plus 2x to the fourth. And this is like x to the first power, so what do we do? Well, what do we do here? We had x to the first in the bottom, 5 minus 1 gives us 4. So 1 half minus 1 is negative half, so this is really like minus x to the minus one-half. All right, so now I have these three pieces. I'm going to take the antiderivative of each. So that means that g of x, the main function, any derivative of this, so it's going to be 4. What function, if I take its derivative, will give me sine of x? Well, if I have cosine, and I take the derivative of cosine, I get what? I get minus sine. So that means I need minus cosine of x. When I take the derivative of minus cosine of x, it's minus minus sine of x, which is plus sine of x. So I have that. For this piece, so remember what I said when we were building that table. We're going to take the x, add 1 to the exponent. That's 5. Now divide the coefficient by that number. So my coefficient is 2, but I have to divide it by 5. And if you want to check your work, just take the derivative. Well, what would I do? I would do 5 times this piece. The 5's cancel, leave me with 2. x subtract 1. So that gets me back to 2x to the fourth. And that should always work. If you want to check each step of the way, take the derivative of what you wrote down, and it should give you what you started with. And now here, minus, so we're going to do the same thing, x, I'm going to add 1 here. So that's what? Negative half plus 1 is positive half, and then divide the whole thing by positive half. So that means what? I have minus 4 cosine x plus 2 fifths x to the fifth minus, and if I keep change flip, that's going to put a 2 in front here and leave me with x to the half. Well, x to the half is what? That's square root of x. Am I done? No. Why? Because I want all the functions, and if you remember in the last video, I wrote it in red to remind you, we need what? Plus c plus some constant, because I don't know if there was a constant at the end of this thing that when I take the derivative just goes to zero and gives me that. So I need to make sure to put that in there, that plus C. All 
All right, so I'm going to erase this. We'll do another example. So this example, we want to find f if f prime of x is equal to e to the x plus 20, 1 plus x to the minus 1, and f of 0 is equal to negative 2. So, first thing working with this derivative, I'm going to change it up here, f prime of x, I'm going to get rid of this thing to the negative 1 and write it what it would look like. So I get what? 20 times 1 over 1 plus x, I'm sorry, x squared. So 20, 1 plus x squared to the minus 1. So this whole thing, when I have anything to the minus 1 power, I can just take it down into the denominator. All right, so now let's find the function f. So f of x, well, the antiderivative of e to the x is what? It's just e to the x plus, so I have this 20. So why did I rewrite this? Well, let's look at this guy. Go to your sheet or your cheat sheet or your handout or your quick reference guide or whatever. What function, when I take the derivative of it, gives me 1 plus 1 over, I'm sorry, 1 over 1 plus x squared. And that's what? That's tangent inverse of x. And then again, we have to put this plus c. So that's what f of x would be, but... It's telling us what? f of 0 is minus 2. Why does it tell us that? Well, by using that information, we can actually figure out what is the value of c so that we can write the function out as it should be. So that means f of 0, this is equal to negative 2. So that's what? I have to plug in 0 anywhere I have an x. So it's e to the 0 plus 20 tangent inverse of 0 plus c. So that's what? Negative 2, e to the 0, anything to the 0 is 1. Tangent inverse of 0. So what radian measure, if I take tangent of it, gives me 0? Well, that's what? That's just 0. So this thing is 0, meaning this whole piece is equal to 0. So I'm just left with 1 plus c on the right side. Solve for c, so subtract 1 from both sides, you get negative 3 is equal to c. So the function f, if that's its derivative and f of 0 is minus 2, means that f of x is equal to e to the x plus 20 tangent inverse of x plus, or well in this case, minus 3. Because c is negative 3, so minus 3. So that's it for this guy. So same idea, make sure we have our pieces separated, simplify it if you can, it might you know, jump out at you then what the antiderivative is. Take the antiderivative, if we're given some information, then go ahead and uh, plug those in to find our constant value. All right, I'm going to erase this. We'll do another example. All right, so in this example, we want to find f if f double prime of x, so they've taken the derivative twice, so f double prime of x is equal to 12x squared plus 6x minus 4 and f of 0 is 4, f of 1 is 1. So, let's work this guy. 
So F double prime is this, so that means what? If we're going up one step, that means, or one level, that means we're first finding out F prime. So we do the same process. I have x squared here, so I'm going to add one to the exponent. 2 plus 1 is 3, and then divide the coefficient by that new exponent, 12 over 3. Same thing here. I have x to the first, so I'm going to make it 2, and then 6 divided by 2, and then minus 4. There was no x here, so now I put 1 in. This is like what? Like x to the 0. So add 1, I get x to the first. So if I have just a constant, then when I take the antiderivative, it just puts that x back in, plus c. And do not forget that here, or at the end things are going to be all messed up. You're not, you're not going to get the answer you need. So that's what? This is really 12 divided by 3, that's 4. 6 divided by 2, that's 3. So that was f prime. So f, move one more level up, same process, repeat it. So I add x to the third, I'm going to add 1, 4. 4 divided by 4 is 1. Here, plus, it was x squared, I add 1. 3 divided by 3 is 1. And then in this case, I had minus, it was x to the first, so now it's squared. 4 divided by 2 is 2. Plus, there was no x here, it's like x to the 0, so add 1 gives me c times x plus d. Or you can call it c1, c2, or I don't know, a and b. Just two letters that are representing constants. So here is my base function with two variables I need to solve for. So first off, it tells us what? f of 0 is equal to 4. So that means I plug 0 in everywhere here. So I get 0 plus 0 minus 0 plus 0 plus d. So that means what? That means d is equal to 4. Now I'm told f of 1 is just equal to 1. So that's what? 1 to the 4th power is 1. 1 to the 3rd power is 1. 1 squared is 1 times negative 2, so minus 2. Plus c times 1, so just c, plus d, which we just figured out, was 4. So that means what? 1 is equal to 1 plus 1 is 2, minus 2 is 0, plus 4, so that's c plus 4. Subtract 4 from both sides, we get c is negative 3. So now we can go back to the main function, plug in our value for c and d. So that means f of x is x to the 4th plus x to the 3rd minus 2x squared plus c, which is negative 3, so minus 3x plus d, so plus 4. So you go on your homework, you put it in, WebAssign or whichever homework system you're using if you're not following along at UNLV here, tells you right or wrong. That's great for homework. What about an exam? If I had this as an answer and it's like, well, do I say hopefully it's right and see what the grade comes back in my exam or is there any way to check it? You can check it, right? Take the derivative of this twice. Take the first derivative, take the second derivative, and you should get this as your answer. If you don't get this, there's something wrong somewhere. So make sure you go back, check it if you have time. Obviously, if you're, you're crunched for time on the exam, you know, maybe you got to hope you didn't make a mistake, but if you have extra time and you can check your answer, just take the derivative of this twice, and this one's fairly straightforward. You could probably do the second derivative of this, you know, probably under 30 seconds, I would say. And then at least you'll know whether you have it right or wrong. All right, so that's it for that example. So really just the last part of 
this video, the second video here for uh, four seven. Um, within the section, there's something called rectilinear motion. And this is on page 250. So I've never taught this course before, of course. Um, I have tutored for it, and I don't remember this being a topic that we, I guess, really did or spent much time on or reviewed in the tutoring sessions. So I don't know if it's just skipped. I don't know maybe if it was that instructor that skipped it, but I didn't put it on the video here just because I didn't want to, again, waste your guys' time, maybe waste my time doing something that wasn't going to be covered. If for some reason your instructor covers this and it's an important topic and you, you have trouble with it, you have, you have trouble understanding it, send me an email, you know, put a comment onto the YouTube video page and I can always go back later and you know, do sort of a supplemental video. But otherwise I'm not going to go through it here in the videos. Um, again, just referencing is at page 250. Uh, so that wraps up the videos for 4.7. It wraps up chapter 4. Come on back. We'll start taking a look at chapter 5, which will be the last chapter for this semester, which is integrals.